books can spark our imaginations, take us on adventures, and teach us life lessons. Today, writer and veteran homeschooler Sherry Blomquist is here to talk about falling in love with literature. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell to join our channel. Welcome, I'm Lisa Maladnik, your host, and today we're talking with Sherry Blomquist about falling in love with literature. Sherry Blomquist is a freelance teacher and author, as well as the mother of four daughters and one son. She's been part of the homeschool community since 2005 as a parent and as a teacher for various tutorial programs. In addition to her work in education, she has written fiction, poetry, and other materials for various programs and publications, such as the Old Schoolhouse magazine, and she is the author of two books. Before Austin Comes Aesop, The Children's Great Books and How to Experience Them, and Maria Von Trapp and Her Musical Family. Currently, she lives in Independence, Missouri, where she continues to write and teach. You can learn more about her work on her website, Once Upon a Pen, and I will have that in the show notes. It's www.onceuponapen.studio. All right. So, it is so good to have you back, Sherry. We're, we've been hearing a little thunder in your background, so kind of exciting to record an episode with this, with the thunder rolling in. How are you I do today? Love rain. <laughs> I do too. You know, cozy books and they are cozy, cozy by the, you know, by your bookcase and, yes. and have coffee and tea and all that. Oh, it's well, wonderful. Thank you for having me back. Oh, it's my joy. And I'm glad to use the word cozy because uh, this episode will air in kind of a cozy time of year. And I absolutely love cozy, the coziness of indoors with a good book when the weather's inclement outside. So yeah. start us off by just saying, kind of how did you fall in love with literature? When did you become an avid reader? What sparked it? <clears throat> Let us hear a little of your story. Well, oddly enough, I don't remember much being read to. I know who I was, but I don't remember too much about it. But what I do remember um, one of my earliest member, uh, memories of reading is the um, uh, is listening by the hour to this a collection of stories and tapes. I have these little square books that were called the Super Scope Storyteller tapes, and there are all kinds of fairy tales and, and other folk tales. And I would listen to them, um, you know, I would listen to them just days on, and I'd always, I'd be excited to get new ones. There were all kinds of them, maybe fifty in the series. I don't know. And um, those actually were very instrumental in teaching me how to read. So I don't actually remember being taught how to read. I, I know that I was, but I don't. Re- but what I remember is picking it up by those Super Scope Storyteller tapes. So they were one of the the they were my first the the first literature would have major impact on me. Um, but my mother was an avid book lover. She was an elementary teacher um, and she loved children's books so much. She still does. I mean, she'll she'll happily settle down with Ramona the Pest just as much as she would with any you know historical novel or something for an adult. And she'll read these books over and over and over. And she would just hand me books throughout my childhood, just like they were candy. And um, But she would give me the ones that she loved herself. The ones from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, you know, B is for Betsy and um, All of a Kind Family about the little Jewish girls in the turn of this 20th century New York and uh, Ramona Quinby and Henry Huggins and, B- and uh, uh, Betsy Tacey. Um, I loved a book called Ginny and the Cooking Contest, which is some forgettable book that was all about a little girl in the 50s who was wanted to enter a cooking contest. And I was so fascinated by the 1950s dishes she would make, you know, like chicken olive loaf and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> I was just very fascinated by, by things like that. But when I got to be in about um, third grade, that's when I had uh, an, I read um, two books that had a major impact on my entire life. And uh, one was The Borrowers by Mary Norton, um, which I actually didn't read. I think my mother read some of it to me because it was too hard for me at that time or too above my head. I didn't like The Borrowers, I'll be honest. I, I still don't like Mary Norton's writing style, but I loved the concept of these little people living under the floorboards, uh, under the grandfather clock. And then, you know, that really 
impact of my imagination. And then I also loved, and this is one of my favorite books of all time to this day, and it's out of print, called The Great Christmas Kidnapping Caper, about three little mice, Marvin the Magnificent, Raymond the Rat, and Fats the Fuse, and how they rescue um, the um, Macy Santa Claus after he's kidnapped um, in New York City. <laughs> and I still love this book. I have read this book over and over <laughs> Um, but I love both, but both of these books impacted my imagination so that I was inspired to write my very first novel called The, Gra the Grandfather Clock Mouse. So I put them together in my head and I came up with this Grandfather Clock Mouse story. And that, um, before that, I was just writing little stories for school because we did lots of creative writing. And I loved writing this story so much. I still have it. I still have all my stories and stuff. I, I it, it ignited this passion for writing stories. Now I was a um, I was an only child of a single parent mother or single parent mother, a single parent household. Um, my father was very involved in my life, but um, I didn't see him nearly as much as my mother, of course. And so I lived with my mother and um, it was a very quiet household. I didn't have any, I was happy to play with other children whenever I could. But, um, you know, I went to school and if I had somebody in the neighborhood to play with, I, I love playing with other children. But I spent many, many hours by myself growing up. And so I immersed myself in this story world. And, um, you know, I'd play with my Fisher Price little buildings and I'd play with paper dolls and um, I and I read books upon books upon books. Well, storytelling, writing the stories down became another form of play for me. And I wrote reams of stories. Stories, you know, all, all kinds of stories throughout my childhood. By the time I was in middle school, I was staying in from recess during the in the cafeteria, just scribbling out my stories. My my middle finger was always blue and callous because I used erasable pens. And um, and another book that strongly impacted my, this and fed into this love of writing is the Betsy Tacey goes. Um, Bessie, I have it up on my bookshelf. Uh, Bessie and Tasty go downtown. I can't see it on my bookshelf right now, but it's about um, Betsy and how she loved to write. And I finally had from the first time I had a little friend who loved writing too, because I didn't know anybody else who liked to write. And so Betsy liked to write. And so <clears throat> she was kind of my little inspiration, my little companion in, in, uh, in this love I had of, of telling stories. And, um, and so those are those are three books that strongly impacted me as a child. Um, I also love Rift Day. I don't know if you remember Rift Day. Do you remember reading this fundamental day that where um, they would come to your school and then you would um, you would get to each class would get to go into this room with full of books and you could pick one for your very own for free a scholastic book or maybe there's scholastic. I don't know. And I love, I live for Riff Day, you know, and it's just, um, you know, I just read everything I could. Um, <clears throat> And so, um, you know, it just, I just became immersed in the world of stories, um, because I, I had to be by myself so much. Um, and when I got a little older, um, you know, and I got into high school, of course, you, you know, I had the standard, um, studies of, you know, the short story, the essays, poetry, novels. And I, I don't know about you, but that's kind of how my entire high school program was structured. You know, each, each quarter was a different genre. Um, and uh, so, you know, I got, I was, uh, you know, I, I learned about the class, you know, I learned a lot of classics that were more difficult, more challenging, um, you know, the good earth and, you know, difficult poetry and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and, but, you know, I, as I, you know, I'm still very much immersed in fiction and just uh, reading for entertainment. Um, but as I grew older, um, and I, you know, I got my degree, I was in English education, I got my degree in English education, um, never um, I, I, I was still very, um, I still had to learn a lot about, uh, literature even yet, you know, the, my literature education course, I had a lot of English courses, but there was still so much I, I hadn't read. And one of those things was nonfiction. And so as I, as I grew older and I grew, um, into adulthood, I began to, um, discover nonfiction and, um, I began to read all sorts of books that were, um, that would meet me where I was, um, in my life, you know, whether it was about fashion or marriage or, um, you know, business or, um, you know, and, you know, just throughout my life, I would just, um, it was always where I went. I would always look for a book to, to teach me and help me grow. 
And so books became my teacher over time, not just a source of uh, entertainment when I was lonely and, and didn't have any, anybody to play with, but it became my, um, the way I educated myself as I became an adult. And so um, I would I would learn about all sorts of subjects. And that's how, over time, I became um, uh, immersed in education and I learned about health. And, um, it, um, and I learned how to navigate the publishing industry. And if it wasn't for books, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be published today. I wouldn't have any books published um, because it was through books that, I grew as a writer that I learned how to write. It was, you know, it's certainly some of school um, and, you know, people, friends and everybody I'd listened to. But um, but in reality, the, what really helped me grow and develop um, were, were books. Um, and so um, it was because of books that I am <laughs> a published writer today. It's also because of books. I'm a Catholic today. Um, I would not be a Catholic if I had not run into Eusebius' his history of the church back in 1996 um, or 95. One of the, <laughs> um, it, it was that book that, that, that kind of led me into, onto that path. Um, without books, I would not be a homeschooler uh, or homeschool mom. Um, you know, I would not have learned about uh, curriculum and education to the depth I do. I would have, all I would have had is what I learned in college, which quite honestly was not good looking back and knowing all I know now. Um, and so, um, you know, books have just been that, uh, the teacher, the friend, the entertainer, um, in adulthood, I got a job at Barnes and Noble and, um, I became a children's specialist in the juvenile department in the biggest store in Minnesota, uh, which, um, uh, was an amazing store. And it was there though that I began to, um, notice, uh, be immersed also in the dark side of literature. And I began to ha experience the impact of uh, how books can our choice of books can really harm us too. They can um, impact us ne negatively. And I began to, um, you know, I'd have to shelve all these books. It didn't, you know, in any subject. I, and so I would see the covers and I would always often choose books to read. And sometimes these books weren't very healthy um, because I'd be drawn to them. And then I would make, uh, you know, unwise choices, maybe even sin sinful choices. And then I would, um, I began to experience the darkness that some of the um, poor discernment would have um, by choosing, you know, uh, bad books um, that those could have on, on my heart and my soul. Um, <clears throat> so. I guess, um, you know, you know, I, I guess I would say in general that books have been just an extremely strong impact, both good and bad, but, but mostly good. I wouldn't be who I am today um, mm. without books. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so good. It's so good to hear a landscape in a sense that you've moved through with all sorts of there's the beauty and there's the peril, right? It's just like our lives that books are kind of mirror that humanity. Uh, we see it on bookshelves, we pull them off and, and we start to open ourselves to say yes to certain things and some are good and some are not. Uh, yeah. We're going to take a short sponsor break and then I'd like to to hear your thoughts on what's helpful to parents in this whole realm of discerning with literature, um, introducing them to their children, what kinds of guidance and, you know, any principles or, or uh, ways you could suggest to us uh, that we can make really good decisions around literature and make that landscape a, a holy one. Um, we'll be right back, everybody. We're just going to hear from our wonderful sponsors at Homeschool Connections, and we will be right back. Hi, I'm Walter Crawford. And I'm Maureen Whitman. We are the co-founders of homeschoolconnections.com, and proud sponsors of the Homeschooling Saints podcast. Which is here to help you homeschool more joyfully, more easily, and more effectively. We want to thank you for listening. And we invite you to check out our courses at homeschoolconnections.com. And now, back to our program. All right, we're here with Sherry Blomquist, and we're talking about falling in love with literature because... Uh, it is a bit like falling in love. We do get kind of enraptured and carried away. And, and just like falling in love, we want to fall in love with the right person, right? We want to have discernment. So what are your thoughts on the things that parents should consider when they're approaching this <clears throat> idea of literature education for their children? 
Um, well, you know, we could argue, we could argue and debate and converse about curriculum all day long. So I won't uh, go into curriculum choices and approaches, except to say that we do need to keep in mind that there are four main genres of, of literature study, at least traditionally. You know, we've got novels, short stories, poetry, and essays. And one thing I've noticed over the years is that over the past, um, well, I don't know how many years, but in my over the past few years, I've noticed that um, we tend to focus on novels and forget about short stories and poetry and essays. That's kind of gotten been pushed to the wayside. I've noticed that in curriculum I looked at, at and not just in homeschoolers, but in, in schools, because I've been in the schools a lot as well as a substitute teacher. And so um, we need to remember that novels are not the only literature worth studying. In fact, poetry is the oldest form of literature, if I'm if I remember correctly. Um, so we do want to give our students a well-rounded education uh, in, in all of those those genres. Um, but uh, we also need to keep in mind when it comes to discernment about the actual choice of books. I mean, there's, there's thousands upon thousands of books, right? Um, <clears throat> and we have to remember that, that when we pick up a book that's in a bookstore and we're in the children's department and we see a book, we think, oh, an age appropriate book for my child. This is for an eight to 12 year old. This must, this might be good. Um, and, a lot of times and over the, you know, for traditionally, I think parents just hand, let it, their kids read whatever, but we cannot, we have to remember that publishers are there to make money, that this is their job and they are not there to um, meet the parents' needs. They are not there to serve the parents. They are there to sell a book. And so when, when we, that over time, the children's book market has changed because people, um, you know, the authors write different kinds of books and the publishers decide they can make money off them. They're put in the bookstores and the parents will buy them and say, oh, this must be fine for my child. It's age appropriate. It's for middle grade readers. It's a picture book. But <clears throat> the, the children's book market does not serve parents. And it has become over the past uh, 10, 15 years, it's become, um, I don't know, my opinion, kind of a dangerous place for children. It's not, when we, when you and I were kids, we could go to a library and we could pick up any book and our parents could be confident that we would not be getting swearing, sex, violence, or, or at least not, you know, a violence outside of the white witch, you know, being killed by Aslan. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we could, our parents could actually, trust the the children's book department um, and not worry about it but it's not like that anymore um, and not just because I'm not speaking Catholic to Catholic I mean everybody's gonna have different points of view about what's appropriate for children to read of course you know depending on your faith but we're Catholics and we want to serve Christ and we want to our children to grow in and holiness. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean reading just books about saints, but we also have to be careful about the content that is in books and how it's going to impact our children. And as I've said before, I have read books that have haunted me in a negative way. There's been beautiful books that have haunted me in the best way, but there's also books that have really darkened me. And um, my mother doesn't know anything about them. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, she didn't give them to me, <laughs> but she only gave me books that she loved. But um, a lot of times, um, you know, we, we, we just trust too much or we look at the Newbery Award winners, not aware that the Newbery Award medal is not being awarded like it used to be just because it's a great book. Now there's um, more, I don't know. I don't know kind what the right rewarding word is. political agendas in a lot yes, of ways. Yes, reward. Yeah. yeah, and you can't just. I've yeah. I've read an award winner that is yes, objectively it was great. I don't remember the title of it. I think it was Looking for Alaska by John Green. I was shocked at what there was in that book. It was horrifying. Um, it, but it was an award winner. I don't know the Michael Prince Award or something. And so, um, I I started a website years ago. Um, <clears throat> that I won't say say the name of it because I'm closing it down, but. Um, and I'm shifting some material to my new website, but um, I started reviewing young adult books because I was so shocked at what I was seeing at Barnes and Noble in my job. I mean, I was okay. So for example, um, when the Golden Compass came out by Philip Pullman, I don't know if you're aware, but that trilogy is the most anti-Christian 
children's literature to ever be published. And I will yes. say it's the epitome of anti-Christian literature. And well, Phil Pullman himself said it's the anti-Narnia. Yes, he even said his, his intention with that series was to, quote, kill God in the minds of children. Oh, gosh, I didn't heard that. But what, when I was at Barnes & Noble, that book came out, as along with Harry Potter. And I was, I was hand selling both books in the children's department. I was hand selling the Golden Compass. And I'm like, hmm, I should read this because it's so popular. I should read Harry Potter because it's so popular. Well, I read only the first Harry Potter book and then, you know, that was enough for me <clears throat> to know what I was selling. But the Golden Compass, I got to the end of that book and I was so shocked at the end of that book. I'm like, is this going where I think it's going? So I had to read the next two. I was so horrified that I was hand selling that book to children um, that I I started, I did a whole blog post on it in my current, that the website I had at that time. And I'm like, I cannot believe what publishers are passing off for good children's literature. And it was a very good book. He is, his trilogy is excellent writing. It's excellent storytelling, but it is horrific for Catholics. It is so damaging. And so we, it, it, he's just an extreme example. There's all kinds of books out there for the, for young adults, now for middle grade, and then also now for picture books are delving into these subjects that we as Catholics cannot in good conscience expose our children to except in ways that are, you know, in, in accordance with our family values. We have to be really careful. We cannot trust children's book publishers anymore, um, and, and especially YA, but, but also middle grade and picture book. When I started the website, uh, the YA reviews, um, I it was just YA that was a concern at that time. But over time, I began to realize that, no, this is changing everywhere. And mm -hmm. the, the authors do not care their authors are there to express themselves. That's their right. Their authors, they mm -hmm. they can do what they want, but the publishers are the ones putting this on the shelves. Um, and so I'm just, um, you know, the, the books that I read from my YA book review website were so, there's, there's some great ones. There really are. Um, there's some really excellent, excellent authors out there who have done a fantastic job of storytelling, have done beautiful writing. Like, um, I can't pronounce her name, Ruta Sepitis. Uh, she did, um, uh, Between Shades of Grey, not, not Fifty Shades of Grey, <laughs> Between Shades of Grey is an incredible story about, uh, uh, the Lenin's, um, Siberia, I think it was, or I don't know, World War it was a historical novel about um, Eastern Europe. It was incredible. Um, but there's so many more that I read that I end, I was shocked. I was horrified. I was like, I can't believe I'm reading this. I don't want to read this anymore. Some of them I didn't even finish. Um, and there's so many like that that are so spiritually darkening for me, let alone a teenager. Um, and so I just want to, um, you know, remind parents that Every classic that we have, we see sometimes just depend on the classics. To, you know, they're safe. <laughs> they're the best literature. You have to remember that classics were once contemporary, first of all. There's nothing magical about a classic. It was once a contemporary book. Sometimes they were they were looked down upon in their own day, like Mark Twain, uh, I think it was Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer. Was, they did, it, he did not impress his peers. Uh, I think he was banned from libraries <laughs> during his day. Um, some books were totally ignored until, uh, until a generation later. Later. You know, even Tolkien, The Hobbit, um, the, the Hobbit um, was only got mixed reviews and uh, kind of lukewarm reception at first. It wasn't until a scandal in America that rocketed The Hobbit up to uh, The Hobbit up to this, you know, this cult favorite. Um, I don't know if people are aware of that. It was not that popular to begin with. Um, and now it's like one of the greatest you know, books of all time. So we have to remember that books have a, a life and they don't always, they're not, they don't always start out impressive. Um, so classics were once contemporary, but also, um, you know, we have to remember that marketing awards, all those things don't substitute for discernment. And parents now have to, they have to at least sum through them. They have to at least get a sense of it and go beyond the jacket. I read a book once that looked like it would be a a story about civil right uh during the civil rights era be uh, about a friendship between a girl black girl and a white girl I thought cool this sounds really neat turned out to be um an lgbtq book but you couldn't tell that from the cover and it was explicit so um 
I mean, it was, it was just like, oh, wow. Okay. This is why I'm reviewing these books because otherwise there's no way for parents to know. Um, so we, we do have to be discerning and we, we do have to look at our kids books from now on. It's just sad. Um, but I would also say that starting when, if you're like to like, well, how do I start? There's thousands of books out there, you know, um, you know, it seems like the classics are just the safe way to go. And that's true. And, and actually, I would advocate, you know, I'm, I wrote Before Austin Comes Aesop because I, partly because I feel that those books, the the great books, the children's great books, or what I call the children's great books, um, those should found our found, uh, form a foundation of our literary education. Because just like the great books, uh, Aristotle, Plato, Shakespeare, Milton, you know, all those 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 help form our understanding of our western civilization and they um a lot of the, a lot of these children's books the classics like alice in wonderland or um you know uh you know the fairy tales um king arthur robin hood those found those those are part of the foundation of our culture and when we know those stories then um then the the books that are added to that over time you know the the books in the 60s and 70s and 80s you know a lot of those are influenced by those earlier classics so we do want a good foundation of classics um that doesn't mean every classic is what your child ought to read though i mean even in my book i don't suggest that your child that everybody's child should read every book that i put in that book in fact some books i wouldn't want to read myself or have my own children read like you know, like uh, the house on Mango Street, because there is a, um, it it is a very influential book, but that doesn't mean I want my child to read it, <laughs> um, because mm -hmm. there's a rape scene, I think, or a, not a rape scene, but a graphic scene. So we have to be careful, even with classics, even with books that are said, oh, this is read in high school, so my child ought to read it. Well, not necessarily. Catcher in the Rye has been read in high school. That doesn't mean your child ought to read it. It's a very well done book, but there's a lot of swearing. I mean, so we have to think through these and not just hand our book, you know, just and even in literature curriculum, um, you know, when we teach a book or a poem or a short story or whatever, we want to think about whether this is going to benefit our child or whether it's going to harm a child. For example, maybe there's some violence in it that wouldn't affect one child, but would really hurt another child because of something that child went through, some trauma. Um, so um, <clears throat> we just we just need to be more discerning in this day and age, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Agreed. All right. Well, um, we know that you're closing your review site, but that some of those materials may end up on the new website. So you and I will stay in touch. And if any of that material is going to be made available, maybe we can share it later on. Um, but are there any other kind of book review sources or places where parents can kind of you know, in other words, not have to read every book cover to cover. I know you said you gave us some guidelines for kind of flipping through and getting a sense of the writing and the story. <laughs> so there is that. Um, any other any other recommendations you can make? Just kind of simple procedural ones that we might take in order to find good reading for our individual kids. Well, there are some books like um, what is it? Honey for a Child's Heart, I think, is was one of them. Um, there are some books that have been written for Christian families to help them find um, find um, rich, um, really good books for their children. They don't. Um, they they try to focus on the the best, you know, the really good books. My book focuses on the most influential books in in literary history for for children um that that is the focus of my book it's not a uh a recommendation book it's it's a this is this is what has formed the foundation of children's literature um and these are good to know about if you want a rich lit literary education mm -hmm. but there are some books that are written with the other purpose of you know, consider having your child read these. And unfortunately, I, I don't remember the titles right off the top of my head. There's a few of them. Honey for a Child's Heart is the only one that comes to mind right now. Yeah, I'm thinking but of Maureen Whitman. Those. Our own sponsor wrote, um, uh, what is it, For the Love of Literature. And mm -hmm. Laura Burquist, I believe, also has a book that's full of recommendations for different age levels. Well, I'll have to find that. Right. 
and and put it in the show notes. So mm-hmm. there are other homeschool moms out there who have done a lot of reading, who have also gotten together with other homeschooling parents mm-hmm. and come up with some pretty good lists. And you can find some lists online as well. Um, I, you know, when I wrote, and you might want to look in my, uh, if you have my book before Austin comes ASAP, you might want to look in the in the appendix because I do list some other. Uh, books um, and also my bibliography. Um, and there are some books in there that you might uh, find useful. Um, and I also want to remind everybody that just because it's not a classic and just because it's not an award winner doesn't mean it's not worth reading. You know, that's important to remember too. Like some of the best books I've ever read are forgotten today. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like the great Christmas kidnapping caper about these three little mice. Okay. That's the, that's the, <laughs> the low end of the scale, but, but like, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's some really, really excellent books that are forgotten. Um, so we don't want to just, um, sometimes it's because they weren't marketed well or because the the publishing company went out of business not because it wasn't a good book um Mm -hmm. so we don't i don't want you know parents might want to keep that in mind as well that any book is fair game but we do you just need to be discerning um i would say that safe you know if we're we're talking safe books where we don't have to worry about what's in it um maybe before 2020 (laughs) um maybe before uh maybe even before 2015 um we still had a book, a children's book market that was pretty, pretty solid, but, um, you know, it's not that way anymore. So. <laughs> right. Right. So we all need to be cautious. Yeah. yeah. So and, appreciate you know, this. Yeah. Um, it, it's good to kind of, uh, to be in this conversation with someone who's actually been part of the, that, that publishing business, like actually handling the products and getting a sense of where they're coming from and and what they're about. And they're not, and we certainly don't always share the agendas of the marketplace. We know that very, very well. Um, I'll tell you, Eddie, working in a bookstore really, uh, really opens your eyes. Uh-huh. I've oh, seen, it's like, it's like the world in miniature and, and you see it's, it's very uh, interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, we see the forces out there. Okay. Any final thought to leave us with Sherry as we start to wrap up for today? Uh, no, I, I guess I guess I'm, I pretty much said what I had to had in mind. But um, uh, anybody can email me if you have any questions or or thoughts. Um, happy to um, be contacted through my website. So okay, so they can just go to your website and they'll be able to message you there. Yes, yes. Right, and sometimes I've gotten it. suggestions for books that I left out of before Austin comes ASAP that should have been in there. Which I'm totally op- open to that because um, at some point, you know, I might want to um, present other ideas. I mean, or maybe have a mm-hmm. blog or, or uh, and then maybe there'll be another edition. I don't know. So, <laughs> uh, that's um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm open to all this stuff, all, all those yeah. things. Oh, wonderful. Gosh, it's been a joy to be with you, Sherry. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for listening. It's been so much fun talking about this, this falling in love with literature that we want to be prudent and discern about to provide works that are worth falling in love with. For and there's so kids. many out there. There's so many good <laughs> books. Don't be afraid of books either. Yes. <laughs> Poetry stories, all those things. There's so many good ones that can really edify us and help us grow um, into the person God made us to be. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Please pray for us. We're praying for you too. Have a great day. And that's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com. Be sure to subscribe to Homeschooling Saints and leave us an honest review. God bless you and thank you for joining us.